Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our workshops that is uh, happening every Friday from 8 to 10. Uh, today, we have the pleasure to have uh, several topics in our workshop. We, we are going to talk about the Caribe, uh, the, the Caribbean basin, the Cordilleras, the Rancheria. And then we have wonderful speakers that I, I will mention to them later. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm just illustrating the slide with the, with the plans for cycle two that we are almost end uh, shortly. I mean, we will have our last talk on this cycle next week. We are going to have an update of the conventional and unconventional resources and Gentufine by Cesar Mora. Uh, I encourage everybody to attend this talk because it's an update. I mean, as you know, the, the agency performed uh, last year and during the last uh, third and um, fourth quarter, I mean, we, we performed uh, a fair way uh, in project. And in, the, in that specific studies, we, we collected a lot of data and all our Gentufine was updated. Cesar, We'll have the pleasure to show to you all those new numbers, uh, new um, prospective resources uh, next Friday. So I encourage all, both, all of you to, to, to accompany this group uh, next Friday. After that, uh, I'm talking about um, I'm talking about uh, August 13 to November 17. We are going to have very interesting uh, talks. We are going to talk about the, the Caribbean. As you know, we have wonderful news in the Caribbean that, that are going to be announced by the agency shortly. Transformation of some TEAs into EMPs. And we saw that the, the, the basin is, is the, 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 the Caribbean Sea and all the basins are, are, how do you say, are, are calling the attention of all the industry. And so we will focus at least two talks uh, during the beginning of our cycle three, it starting in August 13 in the Urabá and Caribbean basins. I mean, and, and we have we are going to have a, a great opportunity of see the work that is being done by Iron, the company that is doing acquisition and reprocessing of um, of a, a big amount of seismic. They are they are acquiring more than 8,000 uh, kilometers of seismic to the and they are reprocessing more than 57,000 square kilometers of, of, of seismic. So we are going to see the opportunity that they are now uh, uh, identifying those reprocessing and acquisitions. Uh, we will have also good news, as I mentioned last week, we are going to illustrate a, a week by week all those opportunities that, were, that are in, in the bank here in the, in, the, in, the, in the storage bank of, of opportunities in the A&H regarding um, those undeveloped discovered reservoirs or areas in which it, that they have production in the past and they were given back to the agency. So we are going to illustrate all of them one by one during the following weeks. So uh, the, the purpose of that is that if you like any of those opportunities, you, as you know, you can incorporate that area into the process of Ronda 2021. 20, okay, and we also would like to mention to you all the progress that this group has done during the, the year in a specific ba uh, um, basins like the Middle Mac. I mean, there we are going to talk about the Lizama formation, which is, is one of the most uh, uh, promising uh, uh, stratigraphic units in the Middle Mac. Also, we will encourage, we will. Uh, mentioned to you and give you a presentation of the Honda formation in the upper Mac. And, and also, it's something that you, you, you will find very interesting and important for all the people in, in that are, are looking for an opportunity in this Ronda, is that we will, uh, mention, we will give you technical talks of the five incorporated areas that, that are being proposed for this uh, round 2021. So a very interesting cycle three, more than 14 sessions we will have here uh, uh, starting August 13. And I encourage all the group, all, all you guys uh, to be here. 
And don't forget the students. I mean, the students that are with us uh, on those uh, Fridays workshop um, on Fridays that we are working very hard in, in preparing in the, with the Minciencias, those uh, econo financial support for your thesis for um, uh, geologists and uh, petroleum engineers uh, uh -huh. in the pre-graduate studies. So don't forget that we are working here in preparing that, in structuring those projects, and uh, we will let you know the details of those um, of those opportunities shortly. Remember that those are, will be in in uh, frontier areas: Caribbean, Caribe, Chocó Shore, Chocó Shore, Tumac on Shore, Tumac on Shore, Caucapatia, and Cagua, uh, especially in all frontier areas. Okay. <laughs> We have one one uh, microphone open uh, of the speakers. Well, anyway, uh, today we have the pleasure to have uh, the Universidad de Caldas giving the first talk that is titled Stratigraphy and Paleo Environments of Colombian Caribbean and Eastern Cordillera Basins based on ANH wells. And it's going to give it given by Felipe Vallejo and Andres Pardo. I have other other speakers uh, that the university is uh, has uh, included in this talk, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of each one. Uh, Andres Pardo, uh, you know, Andres, professor of the university, is he was, was graduated in 1988. Uh, he's graduated from the Na Universidad de Caldas. He's a geologist with a uh, postgraduate study. In ma uh, he's a master of science in, veg in vegetal micropanthology. And he's also a PhD in science from the University of Leeds in Belgium. He has experience of more than, of more than 30 years in the, in in the industry. And he's currently the director of the IIES in the University of Caldas. We have also Felipe Vallejo with us, graduated in 2011 from the University of Caldas. He's a geologist as well, master of science in air science, and a PhD student in geology from the Universidad de Salamanca, Spain. He has 10 years of experience in the industry. And he is also part of the IIES of the Universidad de Caldas. We have with us also from the University Fabian Gallego. Gallego graduated in 2011 from the Universidad de Caldas. He's a geologist, master science in air science of the Universidad de Caldas with more than 10 years of experience and also part of the IIES uh, of the Universidad de Caldas. And if from, from the Universidad de Caldas, the last speaker will be Sergio Celis, graduated in 2014, Universidad de Caldas, geologist, master science in air science as well, uh, and PhD student of the Universidad de Granada in Spain. He has more than eight years of experience and he, he is also part of the IAIES of the Universidad de Caldas. And from the, from the ANH, which is our second talk, Arles Gutierrez. You know him very well now. Yeah, Arles has prepared a very good summary of the Cesar Rancheria Basin. He is a geologist graduated in 2006 for the National University in Bogota. He ran the, the certificate program in geoscience in, in, with the Petrograph, Petro Group Training and Consultant Company that they work in agreement with the University of Oklahoma in 2011. He has a diploma in general in Gerencia de Proyectos in 2012, and he has worked for Gran Tierra six years, Emerald one year, and ANH, he has been working with us during the last four years. So uh, welcome to our uh, workshop this Friday and enjoy, please. Don't forget that any question can be addressed through the chat and, and, and Daniel Rodriguez or, or, or geophysicists will be depending on, on answer or all of them uh, during or, or after. Thank you very much, uh, Andres. 
Thank you, Miguel, and good morning, everyone. I I will stop my presentation. Can you see my presentation, Miguel? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Miguel. Um, um, we want to talk about uh, especially some project that we are uh, uh, making in, with the ANH in several basin of Colombia. And first, I want to present our laboratory, which was sponsorized by the ANH and Min Ciencias in 2013. Uh, this is a, an aspect of the laboratories and the specialties are mainly in sedimentary rocks. You can see in, in micropaleontology, uh, in different specialties of micropaleontology like palynology, foraminifera, calcarium nanofossil, diatoms, ostracods and mollusks. But also we have um, specialists in sedimentology and provenance studies. Uh, some people uh, work in ignology or trace fossils and basin analysis in especially in seismic interpretation and uh, other ones in geochronology and thermochronology. It means that we, we have a group uh, with uh, multi-task uh, or multi-proxy uh, approach to, to um, analyze a basin. Uh, we are in this this uh, picture. We 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 can see the the people, uh, and uh, it's more than twenty seven special specialists. We we make part of the uh, Grupo de Investigación en Estratigrafía y Vulcanología. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, it makes part of the Red Nacional de Laboratorio de Geociencias, as you can see is uh, the Red Nacional is composed by several universities and some entities of the, of the uh, government like uh, Servicio Geológico Colombiano, el IGAC, etc. Um, in the last 10 years, we are studying different places of the country. Uh, in the red points, uh, you can see many of the of the places in uh, we are studying in uh, cores or outcrops uh, as you can see especially to the western part of the country in the frontier basins like uh, choco uh, choco tumaco and of course the caribbean and some parts of the eastern cordillera and llanos and now we are working in a project of the middle magdalena valley this is a picture of the uh, the, dry, uh, the humid forest of the Pacific, which uh, make difficult the, the uh, geological work. And this is a picture of the Western Cordillera, and particularly the Tatama Hill in the in the West, Western Cordillera. Uh, okay, um, this is a picture to show you um, the in the micropaleontology. We use several techniques to improve uh, the age or the environmental uh, analysis from sedimentary rocks. And this is very important for uh, oil exploration, of course. And this is a, a good uh, approach because the palynology, we have a terrestrial, terrestrial fossils like pollen and spores, but also we have dinoflagellates, uh, which are marine. In the ostracods, we have also marine and terrestrial, and uh, they are very good indicators of environmental, more than age. Uh, the same thing for the mollusk, but uh, the foraminifera and the calcarium nanofossils are marine, or mainly marine, and uh, uh, they are very, very useful for uh, biostratigraphy and 
paleoceanographic studies and paleogeographic, etc. Uh, and of course, uh, they are important for uh, uh, biostratigraphic correlation uh, of the basins and um, oil exploration. We are working uh, all, all of these specialities also with the uh, geoscience uh, a group of uh, Universidad de Salamanca. And some of the people are nowadays making his P their PhD in, in this university. This is uh, uh, another thing, uh, another important thing to, to say is that now uh, in 2011, uh, Carlos Aramillo, a colleague uh, that worked in the Smithsonian Institution and uh, collaborators create a, a good um, biostratigraphic tool. This is uh, the, the lines represent the stratigraphic range of several species of Northern South America, especially in the Llanos, Eastern Cordillera and Middle Magdalena Valley. And it is a good tool to apply in the frontier basins. Um, is, it is also important to say that um, the, this uh, biosonation or, or this uh, biostratigraphic range uh, is related to the vegetation of the, 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 the plants or the vegetation and it it means that this uh, is local, it's not possible to correlate for great distance because the vegetation changes by latitude or something like this. In contrast, the marine microfossil like foraminifera and nanoplankton or nanofossils are very important and very good to correlate uh, for great distance in intercontinental distance and in this way, we can correlate the palynological information with the standard biosons of uh, microfossils, marine microfossils, and intercalibrate the information and obtain the good, uh, the better results for the age and environment. Another important thing uh, I, I want to mention is in, with the palynology, we can measure the temperature uh, of the um, of this uh, of the sedimentary rock um, with the color of the palynomorphs this is an example we have an a scale of different colors which can be correlated with the vitrine ref reflectance and with the uh, maturity state of the organic matter and the relationship with the um, generation of oil and gas. In this case, uh, as you can see, the orange or uh, clear brown indicate the main phase of liquid petroleum generation. Uh, in contrast, the upper part uh, is uh, the, the organic matter is immature and the lower part in, in black or dark brown, the mat organic matter is uh, over mature or mature. This is an excellent tool for oil, of course. Uh, another tool is the analysis of provenance. It means the, the provenance, of course, the of sediments, that, um, the different uh, areas uh, which um, the sediments came. Uh, in this uh, kind of studies, we use uh, cores or outcrops the conventional petrography, the heavy minerals. We study also the petrology of the basement, economic basement, uh, probably igneous and metamorphic rocks. We use also the uh, detrital geochronolo geochronology and uh, some t techniques with, um, with uh, a scanning electron microscope like cathode luminescence, uh, etc. Okay, now we, um, we are, uh, I'm, I am going to talk about the project. This is um, a map uh, with the location of the stars uh, are the location of several wells that drill A and H. Um, and the main uh, goal of A and H is to increase the geological knowledge of the basins and their petroleum potential. 
in this project we use we uh, study especially the wells located in the sinus and jacinto fall belt in the caribbean this uh, this part is in the um, cesar rancheria and upper uh, northern part of mid middle Magdalena valley and some uh, wells of the eastern cordillera uh, it's important to mention that this project was made uh, one part by the university of caldas another part by the universidad industrial de santander especially uh, the WIS study this the, the uh, green stars of the big wells and the main goals or the goals of the project were was there to determine the age and the positional environments of 50,000 feet or 15,000 meters of course from different basin. And <clears throat> another important uh, objective was to improve the academic formation of professionals of the research group. So this is what was very good, was very nice. Um, the methodology of the project, of course, uh, the the cores uh, are stuck in the National Core Library, Litoteca Nacional in Pie de Cuesta, Santander. Here we can see the, the aspect of the cores and the, uh, the study of, of them. Uh, the first step was um, to describe fit to fit uh, in detail all the characteristics of the, of the cores. Next, we um, put together all the main um, the main um, characteristic of of the rocks uh, including the uh, electric logs the samples and different kind of analysis uh, the little log some aspects of the um, uh, oil occurrence the fossils signal fossils sedimentary structures and different aspects of texture texture color, bioturbation index, some general remarks and some maps uh, for the general location. And after that, we uh, divide all the, all the logs in phases and we use the, we interpret the phases association, like in this example is a small piece or, or the Nueva Esperanza well in, the, in San Jacinto. And uh, with all the characteristics, we interpret the stacking patterns uh, and um, the, uh, the positional environments, in fact. Um, these environments were interpreted com comparing the, the, um, the characteristic of the wells with the modern environments uh, available in the in the stratigraphic books and something like this. Okay, um, now I want to say some consider consideration about the Caribbean. Uh, Caribbean, the Caribbean area, the Colombian Caribbean is particularly complex, a geological complex area, uh, and for this reason there is different hypotheses about this geological evolution. This is one point. Uh, we have also, there is a high potential for oil discoveries. And now I, there is a new uh, oil and gas discoveries uh, and many oil seeps in, in surface. And this is important for, for exploration. And another important thing is the sedimentary record. Um, it goes from Cretaceous or late Cretaceous to recent. And uh, there is an uh, important variation of phases in uh, vertical and temporal uh, scales. And uh, there is also uh, the presence of regional unconformities uh, identified by biostratigraphy or seismic. And another important thing is uh, the tectonic uh, acts simultaneously with sedimentation. It means that many of the uh, units, sedimentary units, uh, suffer erosion uh, of previously, uh, there is erosion of previously accumulated units. And this is uh, quite 
important to to mention because the most of the studies in the Caribbean has been based in cuttings, in cuttings in, in exploratory wells from the industry. But now with the ANH and the drill of uh, exploratory uh, wells, uh, all of them uh, core, we have the opportunity to, to understand the sedimentology and the biostratigraphy and micropaleontology without this, this kind of problems. Um, in uh, last year, we we made the University of Caldas made we made a, a regional study of the Caribbean, and these lines represent the stratigraphic um, cross cutting that we we construct for understand the uh, lateral and vertical distribution of of faces and units. I I want to show you. Particularly two, the C1, which is parallel to the Sinus and Jacinto fall belt, and the C3 is uh, perpendicular to, to this one. Uh, these uh, lines, it's important to say that it, it was constructed with 58 wells, many of them the new ANH wells and surface geology in some cases. And this is the, the first one. Um, we have here the, the correlation of the wells and units, and in this way we can see the lateral variation of, uh, of phases. Um, my colleague Felipe is going to talk about the, the biostratigraphic tool because it was very important to put in time each of the wells. This is the another card in the perpendicular to the last one. And in this one, it's very interesting to see we, we can identify important unconformities in the San Jorge subbasin, for example, here, and the near to the San Jacinto Fall Belt in this part. Uh, this is the stratigraphy of the um, Caribbean offshore, as you can. As you know, there is no um, drill uh, wells in this part, and this is uh, unknown for the for the geology or stratigraphy. Okay, in this moment, uh, Felipe uh, is going to talk about the micropaleontological results of the project. Felipe, thank you, Andres. So sharing. I don't know if you can see it now. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I would like to start saying that I'm very happy today to share with all of you what we have been doing the past years. And I would also like to thank the, the INH for their support. So what we have here is the summary of more than uh, 2,000 samples by historiographic analysis of pollen, dinoflagellates, calcareous nanofossils, benthic and planktonic foraminifera, and some microgastropods. Um, so what we have here is uh, the result of uh, biostratigraphic analysis conducted on over 26 cores drilled in the Cesar Rancheria Basin, Eastern Cordillera, in Sinus and Jacinto Fault Belt. This multiproxy study is uh, probably one of the first works that constantly integrates terrestrial and marine microfossils from inland uh, rocks of Colombia. So we have been observing that for most of the biostratigraphic results, there was a good correlation between terrestrial and marine microfossils. And they complement one to each other, making H models more uh, reliable. Uh, we interpret that these results are telling us an interesting story on when and how sedimentation occur in, in these basins since the early Cretaceous up to the neogene. 
So what we are going to do now is to go to one of the main uh, biostereographic intervals that we have, uh, have been finding. So the oldest uh, micropaleontological assemblage uh, was found, found in the analyzed course consists uh, mainly of pollen and some uh, dinoflagellates of the early Cretaceous in the Cesarean Cheria Basin. Uh, Microfossils were very rare in this basin and, and palynology was essential to date these rocks. Our uh, biostereographic results uh, indicate a biostereographic range uh, from Berassian to Aptian for the oldest rocks uh, in this basin. Uh, we found similar results uh, for the studied rocks from the Eastern Cordillera. Pollen and dinoflagellates, again, they help to constrain the age models and calcareous um, nanofossils or calcareous microfossils were not so abundant. But once we found them, they overall generally agree with palynological results. Uh, these, the ages of these cores in the Eastern Cordillera can be as young as uh, Stantonian in the, in the late Cretaceous. And here we have some of the pictures of the microfossils that we found in these cores in Cesar Rancheria and Eastern Cordillera. We have here some uh, planktonic foraminifera, and here we have some uh, polynological uh, results on pollen. T stands as uh, terrestrial and M stands as marine. And here um, we have some pictures of the dinoflagellates and the, and the pollen. So if we keep moving uh, upward, marine uh, microfossils are more abundant during the late Cretaceous, as particularly between the late uh, Campanian and early Maastrichtian. Um, so we noticed that in our study, these uh, microfossils uh, document the um, document the oldest oceanic rocks in the Sino San Jacinto uh, fault belt. And microfossils are more diverse, uh, terrestrial and marine microfossils are more diverse in the Cesar Rancheria uh, basin. And they indicate an age of Maastrichtian uh, to Danian. So it is interesting here that the late uh, Cretaceous is characterized by marine microfossils. And the uh, Paleocene is dominated by pollen. And this T stands as a terrestrial. So here again, we have some uh, pictures of the marine microfossils that we found uh, in these basins. Uh, these are some calcareous nanofossils from the Sino San Jacinto uh, fold belt. And here we have some planktonic foraminifera from, from the Sarancheria basin. So, and suddenly we identified that there is a big change in preservation and abundance uh, of microfossils. So they are less common and poorly preserved in the early Eocene. However, the recovery of these uh, microfossils can help us to identify a late Paleocene age for some of the deposits in the, in the Sino San Jacinto. Um, so what we have here is um, uh, pollen is usually more helpful useful in the Cesar Rancheria Basin, whereas um, some micro marine microfossils are more useful in the Sino San Jacinto fault belt. Something to highlight here is that we, is the occurrence of reworking. So here we ident identify some rework microfossils. And the, the rework microfossils, they have an age of, uh, Cretaceous, mainly Cretaceous. And again, here we have some of the pictures. And here's some of the calcareous nanofossils that we found in the early, uh, in the late Paleocene, sorry. And here we have some pollen from the Paleocene in the Cesar Rancheria Basin. So here is one of them. This is a very interesting uh, interval in the analyzed course because we have a well-preserved uh, and um, kind of abundant um, microfossils 
So in the Eocene and Oligocene times, microfossils are again more common than in the in the Paleocene, and in the Cesarean Chiria Basin, uh, for instance, uh, our biostratigraphic analyses are possible thanks to the paleontological record. So microfossils from the Oligocene in this basin were were not found. On the other hand, if we go to the Sinus and Jacinto fault belt, so what we found is the marine microfossils are more abundant and they help us to constrain the stratigraphic and biostratigraphic age models. Biostratigraphic markers of the early uh, Eocene hypression are commonly in this part of the Caribbean um, basin. And it is interesting to note the although rare, some rework microfossils were recovered in these uh, uh, sediments. And they have an age of, of the rework microfossils have an age of um, late Paleocene. Middle Eocene in, this, in the Sinus and Jacinto Basin is identified through palynological results. And marine microfossils are not very abundant in this part of the, of the stratigraphic record. And marine and terrestrial microfossils can be very abundant. On, on the other hand, if we move forward to the middle to late in Oligos and Eocene up to, to the Oligocene. So we were able to, to increase the resolution in a couple of cores of this interval. And what we found is a, was a, a, a broken by stratigraphic, or stratigraphic record with, with some gaps, uh, some, some unconformity. Some, some of them can last uh, about uh, 2 million years, whereas there were others that uh, big gaps. For instance, this one between the, the Oligocene and the Neogene, and which where this gap was around um, five, four, five million years of dura duration. So finally, uh, biostratigraphic interpretations of the of our of the cores that we analyzed show that the neogene can be divided into two. One interval is the uh, early middle Miocene, and the other one is late um, late Miocene to Pliocene. So early to middle Miocene um, assemblage are well preserved. Marine microfossils are very abundant. And reworking here is start, it started to be more uh, abundant. And it's very common to find uh, reworking in this part of the section. So we have uh, identified that some of the rework microfossils, uh, they, they were marine and they, they, have an age, they have an age of um, Cretaceous and, and Paleogene as well. So if we, if, when we get to the um, um, late Miocene to Pliocene. Um, the recovery of microfossils and the resolution of some of the techniques are some of the challenge that we had to face when we were doing the biostratigraphic analysis of, of this interval. Um, there is no good preservation, but once we find um, marine microfossils, they are telling us that, that there are edges from Tortonian to Sanclean. Reworking again in this part of the of the stratigraphic record in the from the analyzer, of course, and they are telling us that there, there was intense reworking from the from the Paleogene in general, from the uh, Cretaceous as well, and from the early Miocene. Some of them they are included in this late Miocene to Pliocene deposits. So as a summary, our biostratigraphic analysis suggests that stratigraphic records uh, of these basins can be as old as the, as the early Cretaceous. And uh, the continuity of the stratigraphic record is, is, not, is, is broken through the Cenozoic. At least five episodes of marine conditions characterize the Sinus San Jacinto fault belt. And integrated uh, terrestrial marine biostratigraphic analysis are crucial 
when dating the stratigraphic record because of the changes and the alternation between uh, um, m between marine and terrestrial pa paleo environments. Reworking again in the basins can be traced at least four times during the Cenozoic, and it became uh, more intense towards uh, neogene deposits. So well, thank you for your attention. And now my colleague Fabian is going to talk about sedimentological features and sedimentary environments of the Sino San Jacinto of Belt. Okay, good morning, everyone. And you can see the, the slide. Yes. Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. And thanks for attending this workshop. And thanks for the ANH for giving us the opportunity of, to study this wonderful rocks. The sedimentation history in the Sinus and Jacinto Basin began in the late Cretaceous. Unfortunately, no ANH wells yet has drilled these rocks. The last sedimentological study carried out by in San Carlos and Chicora Aquarius was developed by Giraldo 2020. He described tabular thin beds of limestone interbedded with mud rocks and shares with parallel lamination or massive structure. Canzona facies were interpreted how pelagic and hemipelagic deposits were turbated by chondrites, planolites, and sophicus, associated with sophicus ignophases. And, and he concludes that sedimentation took place in deep marine environments. But we need new, that, new, new data specifically a core well in the Canzona formation that allow us to study in detail the sedimentological, micropaleontological, and geochemical properties of the most well-known source rocks of the Sinus San Jacinto Basin. Okay. And the Paleocene Lower Eocene San Cayetano formation was studied in many NEH wells. I want to talk about um, five, uh, oh no, six uh, wells, ANH wells, where the University of Caldas made a detailed sedimentological description at one to five scale. Those six wells from south to north are La Estrella 1X, um, uh, ANH La X1A, Moambo, San Antero, Piedras Blancas y, and uh, San Cayetano Wells. Um, in total, 14,561 feet of new sedimentological, ignological, and micro, micropaleontological data were acquired in this ANH wells. Um, and La Estrella Wells contains the oldest rocks drilled by ANH wells. The two wells located to the north have similar sedimentology data. With normally graded sands, we resemble classic Boma sands uh, sequence. At the base is normally the erosive contact, in many times with fluid cuts of, or group marks. The TA facies is a massive sandstone, TB is a sandstone with parallel laminations, TC. It's a ripple sandstone, or in some cases, uh, this ripple sandstone contain um, subsediment structure. TD is an interlamination in between 
Samson and Silson, and T T is a T is an apologetic monster. This both mass sequence is very rare in the nature. The most common possibility is the absence of any phases of Bomma sequence, but these two wells show complete and incomplete Bomma sequence. These little phases are associated with controlled sedimentation due to turbidite currents. On the other hand, the ignological data allow us to interpret that the little phases described above were deposited in an erated sophico signal phases. The most probably sedimentary environment, according to this data, is a turbid uh, submarine fan. Okay. Uh, oh, there are two wells near to Morosquillo Gulf, San Antero and Moambo wells, were studied with the same methodology. The predominant little phases correspond to interformational breakings, fragments of mud stones, seal stones, and very fine sandstones flood in a mud matrix. These sedimentary rocks and very fine uh, these sedimentary rocks and these fragment rocks can be three feet in size. These phases are associated with gravitational collapses in the continental slopes. And we call it MTD, mass transport deposit, or MTC, mass transport complex. In La X well has the record of a Gilbert type grain delta. The top set phases are amalgamated conglomerates associated with continental sedimentation, possibly an alluvial fan. The first phases um, are marine gravelly sandstones with a very high of deep strait. The bottom set phases are mud rocks and very fine to fine laminated sandstones. And bathing forms uh, find that in those mud rocks can be from Batial to Abyssal Zone. Finally, in the La Estrella well, a succession of pelagical and hemipelagical mudstones was described. At the base of the well, interformational breakers were studied. Those breakers are very similar to rocks described in the San Antero and Moambo wells. Okay, this data of six ANH wells allow us to interpret the San Cayetano formation was deposited mainly in deep marine environments, maybe in a sloped for arc, in a configuration of a sloped for arc, as proposed by Mora Work, et al. 2018. Provenance analysis for early Eocene sandstones. Um, were presented in a geosphere paper by Osorio Granada at all 2019, correspond to San Antero well, and the master dissertation by Munoz 2021 uh, correspond to Piedras Blancas well. They interpret that the, um, the, the treatise come from of igneous and metamorphic, metamorphic massives located close to the deposited site. Um, and the source of sediments come mainly from the Protocordillera Central uh, and the lower Magdalena Valley basement. Mm, uh, and the early Eocene sedimentary rocks uh, can be an excellent reservoir. Um, especially in like as well. In all six wells, ANH wells, the presence of hydrocarbons were found only in like as well, 660 seed code tests for hydrocarbons were positive. The porosity versus permeability graphs show the excellent reservoir phases found in a Gilbert type grain delta. And the MTD phases can be an excellent seal because it is mostly muddy. And apparently, there were not a few gravitational collapses in the slab. 
the middle to late Eocene sedimentation site is very different from the previous one. In this moment, this, the calcareous and siliciclastic shallow marine sediment replace previous deep marine environments. Five wells, A and H wells, were studied with the same multiproxy methodology of the second Jetano wells. In these wells, a micropaleontological association allowed to identify five uh, intervals with middle to late Eocene age at the base of Tierra Alta, um, Tierra Alta 1X, San Jacinto, La Cantera, e, and Plato wells. In La Estrella well, middle to late Eocene rocks are in the middle part of the well. The sedimentary rocks studied in San Jacinto well correspond to Paxton, Wakeson, and Grainson with forums and glauconite pellets interpreted with um, mudsons, mud rocks, and very fine sandstones. Uh, occasionally, uh, maybe some marks. In the Tierra Alta course, a study of calcarium microphosis, microphysis is under development. The first uh, results show uh, that the limestones contain abundant terrigenate material. These rocks are classified as skeletal, sandy, packstone, wakestone, floatstone, and rotstone. The sedimentary environment for this limestone is similar to the proposed by Salazar Ortiz 2020, but in the Tierra Alta and San Jacinto limestones, uh, the terrigenous material were abundant. Uh, the lead two phases described in La Cantera well are beautified uh, mud sands with plantic forums, mud rocks, and very fine sandstones. The sedimentary environment interpreted uh, for this rock is shallow marine deposit. For the uh, La Estrella well, the middle to late Eocene rocks correspond to massive conglomerates, beautified sandstone and mud rocks. The sedimentary deposit environments for this phase is were interpreted uh, as fan delta. In the plateau well, um, a petrography uh, study was carried out. The sedimentary rocks founded at the base of the well are organic shales, and the complete study of the plateau subbasin allows uh, to interpret a restricted bay sedimentary deposit environment. This deposit environment helps to preserve the organic matter in the shales. Perhaps the rocks of the middle to late Eocene in the plateau well are the main source rocks of the basin. And finally, a geochemical data for the mud rock found at the base of Tierra Alta, uh, Tierra Alta, INH well, show two intervals with properties for source rocks. Maybe these rocks are correlated with the rocks in the plateau well, in the base of the plateau well. But we need more micropaleontological data to correctly position this interval. Now, uh, now the geology is Sergio Celis. We'll speak of sedimentology and sedimentary environments of the following periods. Thanks. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, before I begin, I want to thank the ANH for their support, uh, for the possibility to study 
these wild cards, these beautiful wild cards. Um, we have also had the opportunity to study some stratigraphic wild cards that have drilled oligocene to lower Miocene sediments. We studied five stratigraphic wells that drill sediments of this age and um, from south to north correspond to San Antonio, Nueva Esperanza, La Estrella, San Jacinto, and Costa Azul. And I would like to start by showing you the San Antonio stratigraphic well. And uh, this well core was drilled in the southwestern part of the San Jorge Subbasin in Lower Magdalena Valley. And it's characterized mainly by variegated matrox with rhizolites and thin layers of sandstones with planar and chocolate bedding. In less occurrence, there are some strata of massive sandstones and sandstones with normal gradation. In this way, and with the absence of marine elements, we have interpreted these rocks as deposited in a fluvial environment. Meandering River with the record of crevasses plates uh, associated with thin layers with trocross bedding and massive sandstones. Uh, flood plains associated with massive variegated mud rocks and channel and bars associated with a strata of sandstone with normal gradation. And this, this wall is interesting because some sandstone present good conditions as reservoir, given the porosity and permeability values, although in this case the flood plains facies dominate the system. These rocks could represent the continental to transitional environment between, Cienaga, uh, between Amaga to Cienaga de Oro Delta. And this leads me to my next point, which are the sediments uh, drilled by Nueva Esperanza and the top of La Estrella stratigraphic wild course. The base of Nueva Esperanza and the top of La Estrella allows to know the rocks of the upper Eocene, its transition to the Oligocene, which are in this part and this part, which are characterized by hydrolytic faces with wavy and plaster bedding with mudrage and homoky cross stratification. Uh, Ophiomorpha is present in some occasions, and these characteristics could be related with tidal floods and wave influence. Then, during the Oligocene, Quercinawar sequence begin to appear. This sequence in and in cold layers, in some cases, in Nueva Esperanza and the top of La Estrella. In addition, massive sandstones and conglomerates with erosive base and middle abundance and low diversity of trade fossil like uh, Ophiomorpha and Escolitos uh, allows to interpret it the influence of Adeltaic system in the basin until the early Miocene. From detailed sedimentological and immunological study, we were able to interpret the variations in sedimentary environments from the upper Eocene Oligocene with tidal plus and wave influence from the to the early my Oligocene, early Miocene, and understand the establishment of the deltaic system. The sandstones of this stratigraphic interval, interval have a radical importance in the exploration of the basin. 
since they present porosity values greater than 20% and permeability greater than 100 millidarsis. More than 200 samples were used in this characterization. Moreover, the sandstones have hydrocarbon impregnation in some cases. The importance of characterizing the subenvironment lies in fact that not entire stratigraphic interval of the Oligocene to early Miocene represents good conditions as a reservoir. As you can see in the graph, there are intervals of 300 uh, feet dominate by mud rock species associated with interdistributary bays. And for this reason, it's essential to characterize the reservoir in great detail. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, some works made our group published the last year by Osorio Granada, and the other one by Manco Garces, showed that the origin of these oligocene deposits could be the south and the east. Our lines of evidence suggest that the source of the Siena de Oro formation can be related to the basement of the lower Magdalena Valley, central Cordillera, and in a lesser percentage, the western Cordillera. Uh, we are also studying other wells for the northeast of the basin. The first well is here, and this well core is here. These wells, the top of the San Jacinto and Costa Azul, are very interesting because they represent distal facial during the Oligocene. These wells drill sediments characterized by mud rocks and limestones with homoky cross stratification, oscillation ripples, and in some occasion unidirectional ripples with high values, values of bioturbation index and an association with tinidium, techignus, chondrites, and thalassinoides. Which leads us to interpret offshore to shelf environment associated probably with El Carmen formation and represent the distal phases of the deltaic system already described associated with Cienaga de Oro formation. These rocks could function as a cap rock, but also as potential hydrocarbon source rocks as has been shown in some studies. For example, this study by Osorno Orangel for the ANH, where in addition to the Cretaceous EOC oil system, they proposed a Oligocene Miocene oil system with source rock and reservoir rock throughout the deltaic system, all deltaic system. We have also studied the rocks of the lower to middle Miocene associated with Porquero formation. And local and regional work has been carried out at ES. The group of foraminifera have studied P18 well core and based on benthic and planktonic foraminifera, they have established a Burbigalian to Langian age and abatial to platform environments for the sediments that are above of the Siena Gaior formation. Furthermore, Alejandro Arenas studied the transandian seismic line and well course associated in his master, in his master. Arenas in 2017 was able to characterize and correlate a regional event after the early Miocene associated with a marine flood. From an electrical record, lithologies, biostography data, he was able to establish that this marine flood event was recorded throughout the basin. And this made, their, this made 
therefore represent a regional cap rock in the basin. Finally, we have studied in detail uh, a stratigraphic well from the light Miocene. Los Pajaros is a well that records the phases after the marine flood, characterized by massive laminate sandstones, conglomerates with erosive base, variegated mud rocks, coal layers, and the lithology, palinomorphos, costracots, and macrofossils, the establishment of a new deltaic system can be interpreted after the marine flood. Thus, in the Oligocene to Miocene can be defined a cycle with transitional to shallow marine environments associated with Sienaga de Oro formation, interrupted by a marine flood associated with Porquera formation and the subsequent establishment of another fluvial to transitional system. Thank you very much. Sergio. Hola. Hola, voy a presentar entonces the final part. Okay, um, we show these these models in another talk, but I think it's, it's important to um, to conclude this this uh, talk with uh, a regional uh, model of sedimentation, and I, I am I am very uh, happy to to show you uh, all the work and all the information that have. Uh, the, the, uh, the course of the Caribbean made by the university and some other people. And this information is a new information, is very useful to um, construct uh, uh, better paleogeographic maps. And then I, I, I will show you uh, the, the results of a paleogeography from the Lake Cretaceous. This is the, the map of uh, Campania Maastrichtian. Um, I, I must mention that in dark gray is deep marine, uh, in uh, clear gray is um, shallow marine, and uh, the yellow is coastal and fluvial, in white is also fluvial, in, in brown is uh, uh, emerged areas or uh, with relief uh, eroded. Of course, and this uh, orange represent uh, um, uh, submarine fan. Okay, uh, and in the in the Lake Cretaceous, we have in the northern nor northwestern Colombia, the probably the uh, the basement of the Central Cordillera emerged um, related to the collision, the diagonal collision with the some portions of the Caribbean plate. This is a regional uh, study. And it, at this moment, the submarine fans were located in the southern part uh, of the Caribbean. And probably oh, uh, we, we study the Western Cordillera and we demonstrate that uh, the turbidific system, Lake Cretaceous turbidity system, are existed in the, in the Antioquia area. Uh, here I I put the volcanism is active in, at, the, at that moment. Uh, and uh, of course, the Canzona formation probably was forming this, this condition. And this is, as mentioned, uh, Fabian is, the, is one of the, the, oh, the rock source in the, in the area. Then in the late Paleocene, early Eocene, uh, the, the basement of the, of the lower Magdalena Valley, uh, start to uplift and uh, some of the previous accumulated rocks are eroded 
as mentioned, Felipe, there is a rework microfaucets. is is very common in this kind of of environments, and the development of uh, mass transport deposits in in uh, um, turbidic fans. Uh, Fabian showed uh, us uh, several wells that uh, can be demonstrate the sedimentology of these this kind of deposits. Then this is pal uh, late Paleocene, early Miocene, early Eocene, I'm sorry. Next is uh, in the late Middle Eocene, uh, Fabian showed um, the evidence of um, mixed platform in the western part and southwestern part of the of the Caribbean and probably in the plateau basin uh, restricted bay as uh, we show here this is important to say that this uh, restricted bay is, on, is also controlled by the onlap of the reflectors with the basement in this area uh, in the oligocene or during the oligocene we we can see that the shoreline start to, to go to the south, southeast, and the tectonics uh, probably control the uh, Magangesi Cuco height, which separates the plateau from the San Jorge Bay, San Jorge Basin, I'm sorry, sub basins. And uh, the development of some uh, carbonates, rifle carbonates but in this period is not uh, very important. Then it, during the Miocene, early Miocene, as uh, Sergio showed, the sea uh, continues to go to the, the coastline, continues to go to the southeast, and uh, some uh, uh, reefs, carbonate reefs are well developed in the Sikuko High. Uh, uh, which were covered in this period with shallow marine deposits, uh, terrigenous and carbonates. Another important thing is uh, in, in this place, as uh, Alejandro Mora uh, showed uh, also, is that there is uh, some uh, shallow um, areas probably related to tectonics. It, it means that uh, the Previously accumulated rocks uh, are deformed, were deformed and um, eroded. In the middle Miocene, this is the uh, maximum flooding surface occurs in the lower middle Miocene. And then all this fluvial system, probably the Magdalena and Cauca, start to progress to the north from middle Miocene to, uh, to um, the actuality uh, and uh, all the surface of the Caribbean was occupied by uh, fluvial sediments. Um, and also it's very important here that as the coastline uh, moves to the north, uh, important an important uh, sandstones of um, Turbiditic fans were developed in the offshore, and they they are the most important reservoirs in in this area. And this is uh, this story that we can uh, share with uh, you to um, to understand to understand the the evolution of the basin of the Caribbean. Thank you very much. And we we can uh, I, I don't know if we have questions. Oh, it's, it's, uh, we, we we are in in time. I think Andres, the questions will be at the end of the session. So okay. okay. Yep. Thank you.
Uh, good morning. Uh, in this in this part of the presentation, I I show the <clears throat> the evaluation of the SSR Rancheria Basin. Uh, this is the this is the agenda of this presentation. We start with the location and infrastructure, following by the regional geological framework. After that, the land prospectivity and available areas, and ending with the some conclusion and reference. Uh, the Cesar Rancheria Basin is located in the northern part of Colombia and is limited to the north by the Guajira Basin, to the, to the south by the, by the Lower Magdalena Valley Basin, to the east by the Serrania de Perija, and the west by the Serrania, the Serrania Nevada de Santa Marta. The infrastructure of the area has main roads that connected the capital of Cesar with the center of the country. With the basin, Two pipelines run out of the freeze, the freeze vein, the Pozos Corrados Galán pipeline, and the Ballenas Barranca Bermeja gas pipeline. The regional geological framework. Uh, on the left, we can see the geological map. On the, surf, the, on the surface of the surface, uh, in which the, it is observed that the basin has a filling of quaternary rocks with some outcrops of Cenozoic rocks, especially in the areas where the large coal mines are located in the south of the north. On the east and west edge, where our chain of reliefs is observed extensive outcrops, the rocks appear from the Paleozoic to the Cretaceous. On the right, you can see the generalized column and the sub-basin Cesar, which is located at the south and Rancheria sub-basin to the north. The section about the economic advancement begins with the Sanson and conglomerate and Rio Negro formation of the Aptian of the Aptian, the Aptian uh, age. Following the sequence of the marine rocks of the Lagunillas and Lagunillas and, and and Aguas Blancas formation from the Cogollo group. Uh, following uh, the chains and carbonates of the La Luna formation and Cretaceous sequences ends with the Clayston of Molino formation. The section fund is stressed beyond the Paleocene where the Xerohon formation on the north, Xerohon formation and, and Los Cuervos Barco is the, are the possible reservoirs. For the Rancheria uh, sub, sub basin, La Luna is La Luna and Cogollo uh, group are the main general uh, source uh, source levels with the moderate and good organic material content. The main level uh, would be Molinos. Uh, the seal level uh, is the Molinos formation, and the reservoir are divided between sandstone. Sansons from Cerrejón and fractured carbonate from La Luna and Cogollo. In general, uh, Cretaceous rocks tend to produce heavy crude oil in Cogollo formation and light crude on La Luna and dry gas in Cerrejón formation. Like the Rancheria subbasin, the Cesar subbasin has the same sur rocks and seals. And there are variations on the reservoir, starting with the Rio Negro formation with my might have uh, the potential to have heavy crude, heavy oils, and Los Cuervos and Barco Formation has the main reservoir of the Paleogene. Uh, the available areas uh, uh, within the basin, there are four main areas available, in total about 385,000 hectares. The data veins, consists in total of TCC profiles on 10 to the same program and, and a linear coverage of 368 kilometers. The area one 
the area one has no seismic information that crossing the crossing the block. Uh, on the on, on of the characteristic of the area one is this proximity with the base of the San Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. So there are a large number of groups of precretaceous rocks in in in, in pink and magenta color. Uh, and there are so colored by the Caliternary alluvial rocks. Only in the north are there are some remains cretaceous of groups in this part. In the area, those more than 70% of the area could be correspond to the horse that this core emerged. Jurassic rocks or the Quinta formation in, in this in this uh, patch of, of blue blue polygons. In the foot one of the San Diego uh, Cuatro Vientos Falls, there are a possibility of the generating some structuring in Cretaceous rocks, especially in the La Luna formation. Pero, but uh, this is low semi coverage makes it difficult to interpret uh, this type of, 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 of play. In the area three, the northern or uh, central zone is presented was a wide region, region with Jurassic rocks or crops. And, and as seen in the semi profile, a large section begun to chaotic reflection characteristic of the economic basement. In the Sorestermos zone appeared the cup crude of Cretaceous rock in the Cogoyo group in the light green color and Rio Negro formation in the spring green. The probabilities might be on the rocks on the Rio Negro formation, which are below to Cogoyo, Cogoyo group, but the lack of seismic information make it difficult to identify. In the area four, the main group belong to the Cretaceous rock of Rio Negro formation and much of the area is covered by the quaternary deposits. The exploratory possibilities are not very clear, given that the levels of Cogoyo formation and La Luna formation are no, not below quaternary coverage. Everything is restricted to the Belen because some accumulation to heavy oil in the quaternary rural areas of Rio Negro formation. So the conclusions, uh, the Cesar Rancheria Basin present possibilities of hydrocarbon accumulation in Paleocene levels, Barco and Carrefour formation, and marine Cretaceous rocks in La Luna and Cogoyo group. Uh, within the basin, there are about 385,000 hectares distributed in four many areas. The area one is not prospected because it contains numerous Cretaceous old groups. The area two, uh, although is Central Park, has a horse type structure with old group of Jurassic rocks. There are a possibility of having a structure, a structure in and other fragments of the pull up basis, pull up foul system. The air three has a low potential that could only be limited on the Surrenster Mar where locks on the Renegro form emerge, but there is a lack of information to colorize disease. The air four has a low potential that could only be limited on the Northwestern area where rocks, rocks of the Renegro formation emerge, but there are a lack of information to corroborate this. And for finish, uh, there are some references that, that used to this evaluation. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Alex, and thank you, the whole team of the Caldas University. So if any of the attendees got any question for any of the presenters of the speakers that we have had today of the Universidad de Caldas or got any question for Alex, we'll be glad to ask them and 
hopefully give an uh, appropriate answer. Does anyone have a question? Daniel, can, can we can we maybe repeat uh, the, the read the questions and the answers from the uh, uh, where uh, where they are addressed during the talk? You have to at least there. I'm I, I'm not sure. Uh, during the the chat, we have yes. some comments, but there are no questions. It's but just, uh, can you read the comments uh, in general? Uh, if there are it's just the, the, it's just the comment of Alejandro Mora about a. Uh, he said, thank you very much and congratulations to NH and Universidad de Caldas. This is extremely valuable information and I look forward to discussing with you this new and very interesting. Oh, there is a question. Eduardo Micucci asked, hola, buen día. Una pregunta, ¿cuándo van a subir a la red las presentaciones de Putumayo y Catatumbo? Saludos. Eduardo, uh, we will shortly uh, ask to the to the promotion the areas area of the ENH because as far as I knew the presentation should already be loaded into into the into the web page. If they are not, uh, I will go in this very moment to the to the area and ask them to upload them because those those of those presentations were a couple of, of weeks ago. Just, uh, uh, just to answer to Andres, uh, Andres, um, uh, pardon, Alejandro Mora. Uh, Alejandro is going to be one of our speakers. He has accepted to join us at some stage during the cycle three. Uh, we will have a special section of the lower Mac, uh, new findings, and we will have Alejandro as, as a speaker as well that day. And when, so I promise that next week on Friday, I will provide everybody with the list of the conference for cycle three, and Alejandro is going to be one of them. Uh, well, uh, Alejandro's uh, uh, presentation is going to be one of them. Okay, go ahead, uh, Daniel. Thank you, Miguel, for this comment. Uh, it seems there is a new Alejandro Mora. He's asking to Arlex, I will make the question in Spanish and Arlex hopefully will answer it in Spanish as well. Arlex, usted tiene nueva información sobre el posible eoceno en la cuenca, en la subcuenca Cesar, tal como la unidad La Loma, definido por, por nosotros, es decir, por, por la parte de Jocol, en 2006, cerca al, al cinturón del descanso. Eh, pues buenos días. Eh, no, en el momento no, no, tengo, no tengo información sobre eso, pero eh, la, la evaluación de la cuenca pues continúa. O sea, eso fue apenas un pequeño abrebocas de las áreas que, que están libres en este momento y pues no hemos adentrado en la, parte, en la parte ya de los contratos que ya están firmados que eventualmente pueden tener algún tipo de, de estratigrafía de esta, de esta unidad. Pues en, la parte, en las partes pues donde estaba haciendo la, la revisión, pues solo habrían afloramientos de, de paleozoico, jurásico y eventualmente el clásico, pero no, no, alcanzó, no, alcanzó, no se alcanzó a mirar esta parte de, de, del, del, del paleógeno dentro de, la, dentro de la cuenca. Muchas gracias, Alex. A Alejandro. Just to, uh, Daniel, just to add to the Arles uh, comment uh, about our knowledge on, on the Cesar Rancheria basins. Uh, I, I just, uh, I, I, I am glad to tell everybody that we have started uh, a project with the UPTC University last week uh, on the Cesar Rancheria and the northern part of the upper, Mag uh, of the middle Magdalena Valley basin. So. Uh, that the study will cover the last uh, five months of the year. And for sure, we are going to have very great news at the end of the process. And so more than 40 people will be evaluating that area is our understanding. And, and uh, we'll let you know the, the result shortly, okay? Miguel? Yes? Hola. Um, 
veo que los asistentes, eh, pues creo que todos hablan español, entonces me permites hacer un comentario en español. Eh, simplemente quería decir que algunas de las ideas que nosotros hemos eh, planteado en el Caribe eh, han sido polémicas, especialmente la del Pozo Plato. Y pues nosotros en una exposición eh, pasada aquí en, en ANH y en algunos otros escenarios, hemos e expuesto los argumentos por los cuales pensamos que este pozo pues tiene una edad diferente a la planteada por otros grupos, ¿cierto? Yo quisiera invitar a la gente que, que considera que la interpretación es distinta, así como Alejandro Mora nos invita a discutir una información, también me gustaría que las personas que piensan distinto pudiéramos poner frente a frente los datos y discutirlos, porque nunca, nunca ha existido ese escenario. Entonces, invito a las personas, veo que el doctor Luis Ardila está por ahí, y las personas que tienen otras ideas, sería muy bueno confrontar la, los, las interpretaciones con los datos y que nos sentemos a mirar los datos. Esa, esa sería, pues, me parece que solo de esa manera podemos avanzar en la resolución de problemas polémicos, ¿cierto? Una de las cosas que quiero resaltar y que mencionó Felipe en la, en la charla cuando hacemos una revisión de la, de la micropaleontología del Caribe y especialmente en los núcleos de perforación donde no tenemos ese ruido de los ripios donde hay caídos, es que en los núcleos se ve que en varios intervalos de las rocas del Caribe, en, en varios periodos de tiempo, se dio retrabajamiento o redepósito de unidades más antiguas. Entonces, uno puede tener unidades eocenas con microfósiles del Cretácico. Y la, la que mostraba Felipe, la, el colmo pues, de, la, de la contaminación, si se puede llamar así, eh, al menos una contaminación natural por procesos de erosión, es el mioceno tardío, donde uno encuentra Cretácico, Paleógeno, y, y entonces deben ser, debemos ser muy cuidadosos cuando hacemos interpretaciones cuando los pozos eh, o los intervalos de los pozos solo tienen ripios, porque ahí tendríamos, si hay procesos de caving, hay fósiles de la parte superior que están cayendo al material. Pero si tenemos un proceso natural de retrabajamiento o, re, o redepósito que ya hemos podido demostrar en los, en, la, en los núcleos, hay que ser muy cautelosos. Ese es un llamado a, a, a todas las personas que trabajan Caribe o, o cuencas con actividad tectónica, a ser muy cuidadosos a la lectura de los datos micropaleontológicos especialmente, que son muy susceptibles al, al retrabajamiento. ¿De acuerdo? Ese, ese mensaje pues yo creo que sale de la, de la charla y de los, de, la, de los datos y de la información que estamos, que estamos dando. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Andrés. Vamos a estar muy atentos a, a crear ese espacio en la agencia. Vamos a ver si logramos, entre ustedes, los expertos y conocedores del Valle Inferior, del Sinú San Jacinto, del Offshore, del Sinú Offshore, eh, vamos a, a crear ese espacio para que se dé ese debate y el país avance en este conocimiento. Para todos siempre ha sido una, una gran incógnita la, entre otras eh, preguntas, la existencia del Cretácico en el Valle Inferior. Entonces es algo que, que el plato, que el Pozo Plato, eh, en sus resultados, eh, eh, quiso, quiso explicarle al país y que, y que aún vemos que persisten muchas, muchas, eh, muchas eh, preguntas al respecto. Entonces vamos a tratar de crear ese espacio eh, muy pronto para que tengamos de pronto en la charla del Valle Inferior donde invitemos a Alejandro de pronto creamos un espacio abierto donde tengamos unos panelistas y podamos intercambiar opiniones y, y, y crecer y, y progresar en esta línea eh, yo quisiera de pronto para cerrar la sesión hoy eh, que eh, invitar a Arles que en español nos comentara en grandes rasgos su opinión sobre el César Ranchería eh, como un preámbulo del estudio que hemos arrancado con la OPTC 
¿Qué crees en general de la cuenca Arles? ¿Le ves en futuro desde el punto de vista de convencionales o crees que es una, 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 unas cuencas básicamente eh, destinadas a ser únicamente a tener un potencial no convencional? Eh, eh, Arles. Eh, pues, ¿qué les puedo decir? Bueno, la parte, la parte, la parte pues, de pues, no, que está que soy ahorita con contratos de, de contratos de AMPI, pues tiene, tiene un, un potencial pues, relativamente pues, bueno, pues debido a que pues, de la unidad, tanto el barco y barco y cuervos tan, y cerrejón tienen, tienen eh, muchos eh, pues shows de, de hidrocarburo y gas, entonces pues eso es, eso es la primera la primer parte, o sea tiene, tiene, tenemos, tenemos un sistema petrolífero completo, tenemos la ropa fuente que tenemos la luna que eventualmente podemos también, también llegar a prospectarla para fracturamientos de, de calizas para también sacar hidrocarburo o sea la, la cuenca no está, no está complicada pero sí requiere un poco más de información y un poco más de, de perforación porque los pozos son, están entre muy viejos y, y muy espaciados, entonces de pronto se, se miran algunas cosas muy, muy, estructuras muy locales, entonces lo que se necesita sería hacer unos, unos pozos estratigráficos que bajen casi hasta que ya toquen el, el jurásico en las zonas donde veamos que sean las zonas más espesas para poder determinar ese, ese, ese posible ley de, de rocas cretácicas para, para fracturamiento, pero no para hacer fracking, sino para fracturamiento normal, como se hace en otras cuencas, para sacar hidrocarburo directamente de las calizas y pues la, la zona de, de, paleo, de paleógeno, de las, de las unidades eh, cerrejón, los barcos y, y los cuervos, eh, pues tiene potencial y, y se, se observan mucha estructuración. O sea, ahí viene la, la otra parte. La estructuración es visible. Hay, unos, hay unas estructuras, hay una cantidad de fallas de, de rumbo eh, inversas. Entonces, la, la posibilidad existe. Hace falta un poco más de, de estudios, de sísmica, de genera, crear más información sísmica, porque la información sísmica está un poco, digamos que de no tan buena calidad. Eso, eso, eso lo vi en la, en la recopilación de la información. Fue complicado empezar a revisar toda la información y ver que esa sísmica no era muy buena. Entonces, hay que hacer una nueva adquisición sísmica y hacer perforaciones. Muchas gracias. Gra gracias, Arles. Doctor Andrés, quisiéramos de pronto para cierre la presentación que nos dieras tu, un comentario general de, de tu punto de vista y de tu equipo. Eh, sobre el área de, de la parte norte de Colombia, cuál es tu visión desde el punto de vista de hidrocarburos, su potencial, áreas que tú creas que, que valen la pena y que, en la cual debemos eh, fijar nuestra atención. Bueno, uy, Miguel, que tantas cosas. Pero lo que yo puedo decir es que la, la charla que se dio en, en ocasión, una ocasión anterior, donde presentamos como el, el trabajo del año pasado de la integración, Ahí al final se hablan de los lugares más promisorios. Obviamente, eh, pues se hace, eh, cuando se hacen los corredores de prospectividad y el Jet to Find, que pues por supuesto es en la subcuenca Plato, eh, está esta parte sur, don, sur del cinturón de San Jacinto, donde está el Pozo Tierra Alta, que Fabián justamente mostraba los datos que ustedes habían obtenido y que, por ejemplo... Eh, convendría hacer un, un estudio cronológico de alguna manera, biostratigráfico o geocronológico, la herramienta que permita ubicar bien esa, esa roca tan, tan generadora o tan, de tan buena calidad. Entonces, pues, básicamente, y esto pues se ha dicho, pero sería las, la, el hecho de que ustedes hayan perforado durante estos últimos 10 años unos pozos nos permiten, por un lado, hacer un marco de referencia, digamos, con las herramientas básicas, las que yo estaba contando, y otras más pueden ser, pero eh, la micropaleontología de varios grupos, ya sabemos que algunas son abundantes y otras son escasas, pero son muy importantes. Por ejemplo, yo quiero resaltar que cuando hicimos este trabajo, se hizo una crítica que los, que los fósiles 
o las muestras tenían muy pocos microfósiles. Y yo pues eh, esto lo he hablado con personas de la industria y ellos pues toda la gente señala que cuando se perforan pozos en estas áreas, sobre todo que tienen tanto terrígeno, es muy común encontrar muestras estériles en microfósiles, especialmente pues cuando hay dilución y hay, hay diagénesis, hay tectónica. Pero en muchas ocasiones es posible que unas pocas muestras que solamente se pueden conseguir cuando uno hace un estudio sistemático de un pozo, le dan a uno un, una ventana adicional para el conocimiento de la cuenca. Y me refiero particularmente, por ejemplo, en esas fases deltaicas que mostraba, eh, que mostraba eh, Sergio de Nueva Esperanza, o sea, las fases de Ciénaga de Oro, se pueden encontrar niveles de nanofósiles calcáreos y foraminíferos, pero limitados a ciertos niveles que nos permiten, como yo les decía, intercalibrar la información, calibrar en tiempo y, y hacer una, un ajuste mejor de los ambientes. Entonces, bueno, eh, sin entrar mucho en detalle, yo creo, creo que todo eso abre una nueva posibilidad de hacer un, un marco de referencia mucho más sólido de la estratigrafía y de las herramientas que cuando las ya las tengamos maduras, pueden ser útiles para exploración. Me refiero a, pues a la micropaleontología, cómo la, la procedencia, cómo la, la composición de areniscas cambia a través del tiempo, cómo, eh, digamos, el patrón de circones detríticos eh, sirve en algunos niveles o en algunos intervalos y en otros no, o definitivamente no sirve. ¿Qué otra herramienta podemos utilizar para, hacer, para patronar? O sea, empezar a hacernos preguntas a medida que vamos avanzando. Miguel, eso sería, pues, creo que el mensaje que me gustaría dejarles a los, a los colegas respecto a toda la información y a todos los análisis que hemos hecho. Eh, pues no sé si alguien de tu grupo quisiera, de los muchachos, quisiera agregar desde el punto de vista de hidrocarburos, si ellos ven, eh, quieren enviar, aprovechar esta oportunidad, ya que tenemos unos minuticos más de, para mandar algún mensaje a, a la industria. Fabián, Sergio. Fabián, tú hablaste del, del paleógeno y los las manifestaciones de hidrocarburos que ustedes encontraron en Litoteca. Pues, bueno, qué bueno ahorita en español, pero mira, eh, algo muy claro es que no conocemos muy bien el, la distribución de los reservorios del paleógeno. La cuenca conoce muy bien los reservorios, al menos, bueno, del paleógeno inferior, porque el oligoceno se conoce bien, pero de esas secuencias que nosotros hemos querido mostrar que se sedimentaron en ambientes marinos profundos, y que tienen una carga de hidrocarburos impresionante porque eran pozos que han estado guardados en la litoteca muchos años y después los sacamos y hacemos pruebas de corte y casi todas daban positivas. Y después hacemos eh, ensayos básicos de petrofísica en petrografía y encontramos que esas rocas tienen una porosidad intergranular primaria muy buena. Otras no, obvio, no todos, pero son reservorios que no conocemos muy bien y no sabemos la única forma de conocerlos es conocer las propiedades sedimentológicas, las características sedimentológicas de cada uno de esos depósitos. Entonces, ahí hay 15 pozos corazonados que hizo la NH con, en estas fases del, del Ipresiano, del Eoceno más temprano. Ahí hay una ventana de exploración de un, de un reservorio paleógeno de edad de Eoceno temprano. Y lo otro, claro, es que, como lo decía yo desde el principio, o sea, la información de Canzón hay que actualizarla. Eh, no, no es tan claro ahorita construir unos play eh, cretácico paleógeno, cretácico ipresiano, cretácico oligoceno, cretácico mioceno, mioceno tardío. Eso no, porque la roca fuente no está tan bien conocida. Entonces tenemos muchas conjeturas y muchas cosas. Al menos Tierra Alta es un pozo que nos está mostrando que hay una posibilidad, hay una roca generadora del terciario, del paleógeno. Lo mismo nos muestra Plato, pero definitivamente la candidata mayoritaria es, es Canzona. Lastimosamente los pozos ANH aún no la han perforado. Pero entonces, eh, en conclusión, si a mí me parece que hay un play que es cretácico mmm, paleógeno temprano, que tiene una roca generadora cretácico y un reservorio del eoceno más temprano y hay otro que también es cretácico que llena en los reservorios del oligoceno tal vez del mioceno más allá 
y también puede haber uno totalmente paleógeno. Entonces, creo que hay que actualizar algunos datos, conseguir mejores datos geoquímicos de roca generadora y volver a hacer un estudio completo de, de play. Eso sería lo que yo pienso. Gracias, Fabián. No, no sé si alguien más del grupo quiere hablar o si no damos un comentario final de cierre. Miguel, muchas gracias. Eh, a mí me gustaría resaltar, digamos, eh, la importancia de tra los trabajos del instituto, porque son trabajos multiherramientas, multiproxis, que permiten construir y darle mucha más fuerza a cualquier modelo de, con, una, con mucho más grado de detalle, porque no solo es la sedimentología, sino la, la bioestratigrafía, la etnología, la procedencia, la geoquímica, los análisis petrofísicos, la sísmica, e indiscutiblemente que eso siempre van a, a generar nuevos resultados y nuevas eh, ideas que van a robustecer y fortalecer mucho más el modelo del sistema petrolífero del Caribe. Entonces sí me gustaría eso, resaltar la importancia, pues, no solo de nuestro grupo, sino de incentivar a que se generen muchos más proyectos y trabajos en torno al uso de, de muchas herramientas. Gracias. Gracias, Sergio. Ok. Eh, si no hay alguien más de la Universidad de Caldas, quisiera comentarles que, que bueno, con toda esta promesa de todas estas charlas que vienen en camino, eh, entre ellas la de Alejandro Mora, también vamos a tener el gusto de invitar a la Universidad del Norte. La Universidad del Norte eh, está ya en nuestro radar y vamos a cruzarle la, la, la eh, invitación formal para que venga y nos presente. Ellos tienen un gran conocimiento del Caribe colombiano y seguramente que podemos aprender mucho de la nueva Facultad de Geología, eh, de Geociencias que existe en la Universidad del Norte. Entonces, Estaremos muy pronto teniendo eh, noticias de, 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 todo lo, de toda la lista de conferencias que tendremos en este último ciclo y con la promesa de tener también a la Universidad del Norte exponiéndole al país eh, y, a, y a todos los que nos escuchan por fuera del país. Eh, en muchos casos ha llegado a 27 países esta charla de los viernes, eh, de los viernes eh, en la mañana. Un agradecimiento para todos, un feliz, una feliz semana y nos vemos en, 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 la, en la actualización del Get to Find para el país en convencionales y no convencionales el próximo viernes y también con la lista de todas las conferencias maravillosas que traemos para ustedes en promoción de la Ronda 2021 de noviembre 17. Muchas, muchas gracias y nos vemos pronto.